when you're setting up a movie like this, there are a number of conversations you're going to ha have to have. One is with Marcus, who has written a book, and the other one is with the families whose sons died on this mission. I'm curious how those conversations are both the same and different. It wasn't. It wasn't a. Um, it wasn't a big pitch. You know, Marcus isn't like a pitch guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the pretty no nonsense gentleman, and, and he obviously was very um, close to this material. And so the the pitch really consisted of um, he he was in LA. He'd met a bunch of um, filmmakers. Um, was about to leave. Uh, I read the book in one day while we were filming. I read almost all of it and enough to know that I wanted to meet him. Um, and we asked him to come down and visit us on the set of Hancock. He came down for about an hour. He didn't really say much, and I didn't know what to say. So I finally just kind of said, um, let me <clears throat> excuse me, show you a rough cut of the kingdom, which was in, still in, hadn't quite, wasn't quite finished. I said, if, if you like it um, and you want to stay, I'll have dinner with you and, and you know, try and give you a pitch. If, if not, nice to meet you and mm -hmm. he saw it and and liked it and, and we had dinner and, and after that dinner he, he agreed to let us do it and then you have to go to the families I assume as, as Pete starts writing we did we went and visited the Dietz Murphy and Axelson families in their hometowns really just to tell them our intentions what we wanted to do with this movie and how we wanted to honor their sons and the extent to particularly Pete's, but all of our commitment to getting the details right and making it an authentic portrayal of their bravery. And that was, um, you know, kind of a consistent conversation. And I think the families were very warm and open with us from the beginning, but also adamant that we get this story right and, and do justice to how their sons died. Um, so that was a pledge we made to them very early on. Mark, you know that doing justice, I mean, that's a tall order. And I know every role that you consider doing and choose doing, there's going to be a mix of excitement and caution. Was it a different equation for this story and, and taking on uh, uh, this kind of material and, and dealing with this story? Absolutely. I mean, initially, you know, I just, Pete kind of gave me a one-liner pitch about, you know, what a great opportunity it is as an actor. And, of course, you know, my own selfish reasons. I was like, yes, I get to go through all this, and I'm the only one who makes it. And then... When I read it, I goes, oh my God, forget that. This is, this is just, I'm lucky to be a part of something that's so much more important than my own personal interest in the project. And uh, But then I felt, you know, obviously a huge, uh, overwhelming amount of responsibility in making sure that we got it right. But the great thing is, is every single person involved in the project, both in front of and behind the camera, felt that same responsibility and that commitment to getting it right. And within that responsibility, how do you create a performance that's not too reliant on what you know about Marcus and who he is as a person? Do you try not to engage with him too much, maybe meet him, say hello, and then go off and find the character on your own? Um, well, the source, the source material gave you enough information, but of course, us wanting Marcus to be involved, uh, inviting him into the process uh, to whatever extent he wanted to be involved. Um, but he's not the kind of guy who's just opens up that quickly either. You have to kind of earn his trust and his respect. So it wasn't like I wanted to use him when I wanted him and kind of push him away or keep him at arm's length when it was convenient for me because this was about them. So uh, as soon as I earned his trust and respect, then I could kind of slowly start to ask him questions. But I never, I never really wanted to cross the line, and I definitely felt like there was a line there. Uh, and if there was something that he was comfortable talking about with, then I would kind of let him kind of open the conversation. And if it was something that he wasn't, I certainly wouldn't cross those boundaries. But I'm still fortunate enough throughout the entire process of after making the movie and going out and talking about the movie, getting to know Marcus as, as a man. And he's a very, very special individual. I'm lucky to know him. Do you watch this movie differently than you watch other performances based on what you know about Marcus and based on who he is? I, I Every time I come to something where we're screening the movie, we're going to do a Q&A and talk about it, I purposely watch the last 30 minutes or so of the movie, and I've never been able to kind of sit there and say, oh, well, we did this, or we could have done that. I just think about what those guys experienced on that hill. And uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's it, I've never experienced that before in any other movie that I've been involved with. Pete, the, uh, the book, there's so many places, so many ways you could tell the story. There's obviously a lot of backstory and training, kind of the whole mythology of SEALs before he gets on the mountain with the three guys. In adapting the book, did you feel pretty strongly that you wanted to get there as fast as possible? Did you consider you know, shooting, training, all that? Or did you want to just start <clears throat> as soon as you could with what happened? Um, there, there were kind of three different chapters in the book. or the, the book was, I think, 
sort of divided up into three different experiences. One was um, a, a very thorough um, explanation and revisiting of how the Navy SEAL selection process, which is, um, for, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm sure you guys have all heard it, it's not easy to become a Navy SEAL, and that's an understatement. And Marcus spends a lot of time talking about just how hellacious that experience was and how that brotherhood uh, is forged out of adversity and pain and suffering and real, real friendship and that kind of bond isn't forged out of comfort and happiness and security. And so the, the SEAL community has developed this almost scientific program to, to basically demolish human beings, uh, certainly physically, and, and test their will at the, the most uh, you know, profound at its core. And um, that was a big part of the book. And I felt that that was just almost its own its own experience. And so that's why we just did the opening credit sequence. Um, you know, kind of late I, in the game, I thought that we could at least touch upon what Latrell had talked about and hopefully mm -hmm. give an audience um, some idea of how these guys could actually do what they did, how they could fall off those cliffs, how they could survive. Danny Dietz was shot 11 times. I mean, I read his autopsy report. Um, and he kept kept going, and and there's there's a reason, you know. But I've, uh, people have, have asked me, is that real? Could they really do it? And the, these these men are extraordinary, and they have a, a a chip, for lack of a better word, that that I certainly don't have. You probably do have it. Um, <laughs> you never know. That's one of the funny things about it. In fact, you never ever know. Um, when I was observing my first Hell Week, the two guys that were always way out in front, uh, one was this big kind of Brad Pitt looking guy, you know, six foot three, his father was a congressman. He was at Annapolis, this kind of golden child. Uh, and he was way out in front. And the guy that was always right on his heels was this little five foot one uh, Spanish kid who did work for Domino's Pizza in the right. Bronx. And the, the two of them won everything. And, and that was when I first realized, you, you never know who's, who's so um, that was a part of the book that didn't make it as much. And then the other part was, um, Marcus talked a lot about the vigil that was going back at his at his mother's ranch in Texas, which is really fascinating. You know, hundreds and hundreds of people came and sort of did this six, seven day vigil as they were waiting to hear whether he was dead or alive. Um, and he talked a lot about that. And to to me, that that was a very interesting part of the story. But I, I, I wanted to focus on on the, the what happened on that mountain and what, you know, put put Mark through what Marcus had gone through. And, and have you had a chance to talk to the families after they've seen the film or showing it to them? What was that experience like, Sarah? We did. Um, very early on after we locked the cut, we invited Universal, I should say, flew all the families, the, uh, uh, the Deets, uh, Christensen's, uh, Shane Patton's family, the Murphys, and the Axelsons to a theater at Universal. Um, to show them the movie because it was important to us that they see it first with us in a safe environment and be able to tell us what they thought about it. Um, and as you can imagine, one of absolutely the most nerve wracking moments of my life really. And, and I think we were quite anxious about it. And, um, you know, Pete said, and it's true, we had a therapist there, a military therapist trained to deal with families um, in grief, to be there for counseling afterwards. And um, the family members were, at the end of the movie, very moved, very touched, but also very thankful, clear from the second um, you know, the lights came up that we had done a good job. And so that meant everything to us. We were both very rattled. We could barely when, when, keep when, it together. When Mrs. Axelson, uh, the um, the you know the mother of the seal that Ben Foster plays, she said, "Okay, well, on behalf of the families, we want to say we approve of this and we 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 bless this film." And then I started crying real hard because right. I'd kept it in for so <laughs> long. And then I had the grief therapist on me talking to me. <laughs> And I'm like, and then I had the Mrs. Deach and Mrs. Axelson comforting me. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, we, we, we had kept this in for quite a while and we were scared of how the families were going to respond. And knowing that if, you know, in, in this day and age, it would only take one family member to say, right. you know, this is unacceptable, this is offensive, and, you know, put that online. And it would have been very upsetting to us. So it, it was unique. We've never had that kind of weird pressure, you know, that was very, very intense. And it was a great relief 
just show, show it to the families and, and have them nod, you know, to give us the support.